vacant seats left, I see. But you have chosen the better things, and I'm so glad that you did, and I know that you have been enjoying this time together. Some good friends of this institution have given sacrificially to fund our lecture series so that we can afford to have people come in and to speak to you and to pour into your life from what God has given them uh, experience and knowledge and training uh, to be what we consider experts in. And I think that our speaker so far has proven himself in that area. And we are uh, thankful to those people who make this possible. Uh, thankful to Dr. Smith for the connections that he has. A short while ago, I turned the lecture, responsibility of the lecture series over to our preaching professor. And I'm so glad that I did. He's younger than I am. He has more up on who's who in Baptist life and uh, has connections and, and knows who to get in contact with. And I know that you have enjoyed our time together with Dr. Sam Greer as he has shared with us on a very important topic. We won't know this side of eternity how many marriages may be saved, maybe someone that's sitting here, it may be their own, or it may be someone that you'll be able to help with the advice that you have here. But we just thank God in advance for what he will do uh, throughout your life and ministry with this series. And so let's invite the Lord uh, to be with us again, and we will turn it over to Dr. Greer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for dedicated Christians who God uh, pour not only of themselves, but of their uh, resources, their finances, their prayers, all those things, Lord, that events like this might happen. We thank you, God, for students of your word who see the importance of being trained in every facet and every area of ministry. And we thank you for our speaker today. God, we just pray that you would continue to speak through him, empower him. We thank you, God, for the connection that he has with these students and the expertise that he has to share. And, Father, I know that he would agree with me that what he has comes from you. And so, God, speak to us through him today, we pray, and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, and amen. Well, good morning. Y'all look very um, awake today, so glad you're here. Uh, thank you for taking time to spend a couple hours this morning talking about marriage. I can remember my seminary days, undergraduate days, master doing my master's work at New Orleans, and I wrote my dissertation on David Jeremiah's preaching. Actually, I wrote it on his use of application in preaching. I used Haddon Robinson's book on biblical preaching as a, um, as a tool to help me analyze Dr. Jeremiah's preaching. And the guys that I was in, in, in I, got a, I got a doctorate in preaching. And so the other students with me in preaching, they would, we'd meet, you know, in class and uh, we'd meet after class and we'd cry together and mourn together through another class. And one day we were meeting and they were talking about how they had spoken to the guy they were doing their dissertation on. And I interviewed him. This is what he said. And I interviewed my guy and this is what he said. And I had called Dr. David Jeremiah's office and left him a message about 11 months earlier. And I hadn't heard anything from him. And so they were picking on me about not hearing from David Jeremiah and that kind of thing. So one Wednesday afternoon, I was getting ready for Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting and sitting in my office and my cell phone rings. I don't recognize the number. And I answer it. I say, this is Sam. And on the other end, the voice said, well, this is David Jeremiah. And I immediately said, yeah, right. This is David Jeremiah. Sure. Because I knew it was one of my buddies calling me, you know, jabbing at me again. Well, a few more seconds into the conversation, I figured out this really is David Jeremiah on the phone. I mean, it's really him. And he talked to me about 15 minutes, and I was able to interview him. So just thinking back on those days of studying and trying to get deadlines and assignments done, 
uh, you are close to my heart. So I, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busyness in studying and whatnot to be here today. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you or a copy of God's Word to open to Hebrews 13 verse 4. Hebrews 13 uh, verse number 4. Now, Hebrews chapter 13 is an interesting chapter. The chapter reminds me of the book of James in that it's a chapter where we see the author of Hebrews uh, just get to the nuts and bolts, the nitty-gritty, the meat and potatoes. He, he just gets to the, uh, to the essentials and the basics. And one of the nuts and bolts that made the list... Is marriage. Verse 13, I mean chapter 13, verse number 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Father, may you be honored by the reading and receiving in response to your word, and God's people said, Amen. Hebrews 13, verse number 4. I want to speak to you a few minutes on this first session about making much of marriage. We have been called to make much of marriage. Marriage is being made less and less of, if you've been paying attention in our world today, And the Bible, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord Jesus, God the Father, has called us to make much of marriage, to make a big deal out of marriage, to celebrate marriage. Marriage rates have been declining since the 1970s. That's no secret. In fact, uh, nearly 50% of Americans today, this number was 28% in the 70s, Today it's 50% of Americans will say marriage is obsolete, it's irrelevant, it's outdated. So as you minister in your context, you're going to be ministering to folks who at least half of them potentially will have the mindset that marriage is disposable, it's obsolete, it's irrelevant, it's outdated. 71% say it's not very important for a couple to marry if they have children. 85% say marriage is not important for couples who plan on spending their lives together. Yet 70% of Americans have been married at some point in their lifetime. And what's more, 80% of singles are hoping one day to be married. So here's what's happening. This phenomenon that's occurring is uh, fewer and fewer people are getting married. More and more people are waiting later in life to be married. Uh, Fewer Americans see marriage as important, but more and more are hoping, hoping, hoping one day to say, I do. So that's the dilemma we're facing. As the church, that's what we're facing today. Uh, So how do we make much of marriage? I believe there's two places that we need to make much of marriage based on this verse. So two places that you and I must make much of marriage. The first place we got to make much of marriage is in public. Somebody say public. Public. Yes, make much of marriage in public. Uh, The the phrase used here is let marriage. Now, if you've ever read the book of Hebrews, you'll notice there's a little phrase this author loved to use, let, let us. There's 14 let us statements in the book of Hebrews. Let us be careful not to fall short of God's rest. Let us enter His rest. Let us hold firmly to the faith. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. Let us leave the elementary teachings. Uh, Let us uh, draw near to God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we possess. Let us spur one another on. Let us throw off that which hinders us. Let us run with endurance the race set before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us be thankful. Let us go outside the camp. Let us offer a sacrifice of praise. And here we see let marriage be held. Now I don't know if the author of Hebrews 
we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We know the Holy Spirit wrote the book of Hebrews, but we don't know what person he chose to write this letter. I don't know if he was kin to uh, that guy that has made over $400 million saying, let's get ready to rumble. But he seems to use this phrase, let us, let us, let us, let us, let us, over and over again. And in the last chapter here, in verse 4, he says, let marriage. Now, marriage, according to the Greek, refers to state of being married. That's what it means. State of being married. And you know this, and I know this too. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, if you study from Genesis to Revelation, 100% of the time, marriage was between a man and a woman. Not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman, not a person and whatever they feel like they want to marry, but between a man and a woman. And so as followers of Christ in a world that rejects that wholeheartedly, we've got to make much of marriage in public. Well, how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of ways to do it. My my wife Tanya and I, we love to go on date nights, on Friday nights. We'll go to the movies quite a bit if there's something there we can watch and we're interested in seeing. And it never fails. It's always the same. Uh, Tanya always says, I don't want any popcorn as she eats half my bucket of popcorn (laughs) on the way to our seats. It's half gone. And I've learned something that, uh, guys, uh, your wife, she can have all your popcorn and all your french fries and you can't have any of hers. And that's just the way it is. Uh, We make much of marriage in public when we... Uh, go out together and we treat one another in in a way that that brings honor and glory to to the Lord and we are intentional about that. As Every time we go out to eat, we go sit down and the server comes to our table and we always ask the question, in what way can we pray for you and uh, we get build a relationship and we'll frequent the same restaurants. I'd encourage as you get older and in ministry to do something like that, to try to be consistent. Uh, in building relationships with people that you do not know. And Tony and I love to do that. We love to go on double dates sometime with other couples and try to mirror what it looks like. We we love making much of marriage in public. You see, what what this text is teaching us, and this is going to be helpful for you in your marriage, it's going to be helpful for you as you minister to other people in marriage. This is important. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Listen, is marriage required of everybody? No. Marriage is not required of all, but it must be respected by all. It absolutely must be. Marriage is not to be redefined by anybody, but it is to be respected by everybody. Uh, Marriage is is not to be reevaluated by anybody, but it's to be valued by everybody. You, You realize that God the Father, God the Son... And God the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity, affirm marriage at specific points in Scripture. God the Father did it in Genesis 2. Therefore let a man leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, affirms it in Matthew 19. Therefore let a man leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Isn't it fascinating? that when Christ is asked a question about marriage, He doesn't at that point say, well, you know, it's been a while since my father defined and designed marriage. Now that's outdated, that's irrelevant. Now I'm going to redefine it. He didn't do that, did He? Nope. He, He just simply proclaimed what God the Father had already designed, instituted. Then we see God the Holy Spirit over in Paul's writings affirming the same thing through the Apostle Paul. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
through God the Father's creation, or through the Trinity's creation, through the Trinity's incarnation in Christ, through the Trinity's inspiration, through the Holy Spirit, what we find is the entire Trinitarian, the, the, the triune God, entirely affirms marriage. So what does that mean for us? Here's what it means. Marriage is what God says it is, not what man says it is. Marriage it, it was instituted before the church and before government. So I want to tell you, there is no church who has any authority to redefine marriage and say we're going to be more exclusive. I mean, I mean we're going to be more inclusive and we're going to invite more people. And we've got a church right next to us. It just happens to be a Methodist church. It's Red Bank United Methodist Church. So we have Red Bank Baptist Church, Red Bank United Methodist Church, and then Red Bank Church of Christ. So Red Bank United Methodist right in the middle. And the pastor of Red Bank United Methodist has said, we've got two conservative churches on either side of us. We need to be the church that embraces all types of marriages. We need to be inclusive and embrace all definitions of marriage. No church has the authority to do that. None. Why? Because marriage is older than the church. No government has any authority to redefine marriage. Marriage is older than government. So let's be sure that we're making much of marriage in public. Look what the text says again. Verse 4, Let marriage be held in honor among all. All means all. That's what it means. We've got a business right next to our house. They have a sign out front, a banner. And on the top of this banner, it reads very clearly, All competitor coupons accepted. Big black bold letters, All competitor coupons accepted. At the bottom, in big bright red letters, Some exceptions apply. Well, which one is it? Is it all or is it some? All here does not mean some, it means all. All means all. It must be held in honor among everybody, among any and every, among all kinds, marrieds, unmarrieds, remarrieds, demarrieds, one day hope to be married, never wish they got married, never want to get married. It's to be held in honor among all. Now, this is an interesting statement to find here in this letter. Why is it here? What was happening in the context of these Hebrew Christians? What was going on that would cause the Holy Spirit to place this in the text? Well, one thing that was going on, I'm not saying this is the sole reason, but one thing that was happening in this day, there were two trains of thought when it came to marriage uh, during this day from uh, the world's train of thoughts. One of those is um, what we call asceticism. And asceticism is simply a a self, a severe self-denial, self-discipline type of lifestyle. It's an avoidance of of any indulgences at all, uh, typically for religious reasons. And those who hold to asceticism uh, in this lifestyle believe that marriage is too indulgent. So they reject marriage. They reject God's good gift of marriage because they're going to be, they have this self-made religion. They're going to be more religious than anybody else. They're going to reject marriage. In fact, celibate monks derived from this train of thought called asceticism. Celibate monks came out of early asceticism. And so to such as these, uh, those who choose marriage according to this ascetic, uh, ascetic lifestyle, those who choose marriage choose inferior spirituality. They are inferior. Marriage then was implicitly dishonored by saying that married folks were inferior spiritually. So it it dishonored marriage. That's why we have written here, let marriage be held in honor among all. Count Leo Tolstoy, late in his life, embraced a marital asceticism lifestyle. And this is what he said to his own daughter. And I quote, I can understand why a depraved man may find salvation in marriage. But why 
a pure girl should want to get mixed up in such a business is beyond me. If I were a girl, I would not marry for anything in the world. And so far as being in love is concerned for either men and women, since I know what it means, that is, it is an ignoble and above all an unhealthy sentiment, not at all beautiful, lofty, or poetical, I would not have opened my door to it. I, I, I would have taken as many precautions to avoid being contaminated by that disease called marriage as I would to protect myself against far less serious infections such as scarlet fever, end quote, to his own daughter. Today, it'd be like him saying, I'd rather have a, a, a serious infection of COVID-19 had I get married, right? That's dishonoring marriage completely, totally, and utterly. Now, the other side of the spectrum, the other train of thought was called libertinism. The libertines were an interesting group of folks. Uh, you spell that L-I-B-E-T, L-I-B-E-R, sorry, T-I-N-I-S-M, libertinism. Uh, they were a group of folks who were on the opposite spectrum. They said marriage was too restrictive in that you could only have uh, sexual intimacy with one person and that was just too restrictive for them. It was an unreasonable standard for them. So libertinism is an extreme form of hedonism which is the pursuit of pleasure. And so they were on the other extreme and most attacks on marriage today come out of that train of thought, that, that train of thought. Again, in this situation, marriage is being dishonored. They view marriage as optional. They view marriage as, as something that, where gender is irrelevant according to the culture. And it can end at any time for any reason it's disposable. So you've got these two trains of thought. Libertinism and asceticism that are attacking marriage. And the author of Hebrews says, Let marriage be honored among all. Now I understand you are going to have some counseling sessions with some folks who are single, divorced, widowed, and you need to communicate to them that they are not second-class citizens because they're not married. You need to communicate that to them. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 says, Hey, look, if you're single... You can serve God without the distractions. You can serve God without the commitments that you find in marriage, right? There's nothing wrong with singleness at all. So understand, you're going to have some folks that will remain single or go through a rough divorce and don't allow Satan to, to lure you into adopting a, a low value of marriage if, if you are single, divorced, or widowed. You need to communicate that. Some people have a bad taste in their mouth about marriage. Don't counsel them to not let Satan lure them into that train of thought. Maybe they were divorced. Uh, maybe their marriage hurt them, literally hurt. Don't dismiss that hurt. Don't discount it. Maybe they're in a bad marriage at that very moment. Okay, but here's what we can't do. That, that doesn't mean that, that we can speak a disparaging word against this institution that God has put together, this gift He's given us that we know is marriage. It's to be held in honor among all. And not only from a theological perspective and from this contextual perspective, but also practically. Tanya and I, my wife, just wrote a book called Gospel Conversational Marriage. It's being edited right now. And in this book, we talk about how some of the benefits of marriage from a practical perspective. Did quite a bit of research on this. I want to share some of this with you because this is amazing what we discovered about uh, how important marriage is in our culture from a practical perspective. We know what it, theologically, where the word stands and contextually for this text, we, we've kind of touched on that today. But practically, why should we make much of marriage on a day-to-day -day basis, practically in our life. Why should we do that? Listen to some of this. Amazing. The Spectator recently reported that underachieving children and child poverty have one common denominator. That common denominator is not race. That common denominator is not social status. That common denominator is not gender. The common denominator is the state of marriage and its sinking rates. 
No other form of relationship offers anywhere near the same level of stability in any thriving culture in the whole of human history than the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. And I'm convinced if we cared about children, if we cared about children, then we'd care about marriage. But here's what we've done. Now, we paint this facade that, oh, we care about children. But let's not pretend that we have abandoned marriage for the benefit of children. We've not abandoned it as a culture for the benefit of children. We've abandoned marriage solely for the benefit of adults. It's on us. Abortion rates. 83% of women getting abortions are unmarried. 83%. 67% have never been married. 16% are divorced or widowed. Married women are far less likely than unmarried women to get an abortion. What about sex trafficking? Child trafficking. Uh, 88% of children that are trafficked through the sex industry are in the care of child welfare. They do not come from a home where there's a husband and a wife, mom and dad. Uh, What about physical health and financial stability? Married couples have better financial stability and physical health. Study after study after study after study proves that. Kids raised in single-parent homes are more likely to commit violent crimes, use drugs. Child poverty uh, is reduced by over 80% in in the home of of a marriage between a husband, uh, a man, and a woman. Uh, Use of porn is less in marriage than outside of marriage. We can say this, marriage remains America's strongest anti-poverty, anti-crime, pro-health institution, period. Abortion, adoption, child poverty, sexual abuse, underachieving in education, sex trafficking, all these are vital issues. And some of those are really on the forefront of our Southern Baptist Convention right now. Many of those. And they're important. Every convention I go to, there's a resolution for abuse and a resolution uh, for abortion. And and those those are so important. And and we need to focus on those. We need to be concerned about those. But, But I charge you from Scripture to understand those are symptoms. Those are symptoms of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is we've abandoned marriage. Where did Satan attack? In Genesis 3, what, where did he attack? He attacked the marriage. He went to Eve. And now, as a result, women are tempted to rule over their husband, as God said in Genesis 3. Right? Why? The marriage relationship was attacked. That's where Satan's attacking. That, that is the source of all these symptoms, is the abandonment of marriage. And it's to be held in honor among all. Marriage is more dismissed in our culture than it is missed. It's more dishonored than it is honored. So, hey, let's make much of marriage in public. Amen? All right, here's a second place we've got to make much of marriage. Not only in public, but we've got to make much of marriage in private. Okay, in our homes, in our families. Uh, Here's how the Lord says it in verse 4. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So let the marriage bed be undefiled. Uh, Obviously, making much of marriage in private. Uh, one, (laughs) One husband said, On the day that I forgot our anniversary, my wife gave me the best anniversary gift she could ever give me. She forgot her anniversary too. One mom says, what's your secret to 55 years of marriage? She replied, we've never hated each other on the same day. That's good advice. Don't hate each other on the same day. Good advice. So how do we do this in our marriage relationship, making much of marriage? Well, here there's an interesting phrase. Look at marriage bed. Now we know what a bed is. It's a place where you lie down. In marriage, an extension of that is, of course, referring to sexual intimacy between a man and a woman within the bonds of marriage, right? So, uh, how do we know that sex belongs in marriage and nowhere else? Well, God tells us here. Uh, Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Let Let it remain pure 
let it be unstained. Let it be undefiled. In other words, look what it says, God will judge. In other words, God takes sexual sin seriously. He takes it seriously. Who's He going to judge? Well, look, look, look who it tells us who's He going to judge. The sexually immoral and adulterous. Well, what does that mean? Well, that covers everybody. <laughs> the sexually immoral cover those who are unmarried. The adulterous cover those who are married. <laughs> so God's going to judge everybody. And He takes sexual sin very seriously. Uh, God's scope here includes marrieds and unmarrieds. That means that sex is only meant for the marriage bed. If you're married, then you're accountable to God to remain faithful and not commit adultery. Uh, but engage with your spouse in sex only. If you're not married, then you too are accountable to God and not to engage in any sex, including premarital sex, any type of sex. If it's Adultery, pornography, one night stand. Again, sex was created for a till death do us part lifetime. Not a till dawn do us part lifestyle. Right? Biblical marriage is necessary for sex and sex is necessary for biblical marriage. Biblical marriage is necessary for sex and sex is necessary for biblical marriage. So how can you make much of marriage in private? How can we do this? Uh, when you get to the place where you have children, let me encourage you in a couple of ways. Now, our kids are not grown. They're 15 and 12. Uh, okay, so they're growing up. Uh, but both of our girls know that we love them. They know that. We tell them that. We show them that. But they also know that mom and dad love mom and dad more than mom and dad love them. They know that. We tell them that and we show them that. And that's important. Here's what's so important for us to do. It's important for us to encourage marriage early in our kids' lives. Now, I'm not suggesting encourage them to get married at a young age. That's not what I'm suggesting. But early in their life, teach them that marriage is good. It's not bad. It's a gift. It should not be merely an option for them like a career they choose. We should make it more than that. Make it the expectation. Now pray for them. Pray for their future spouse. Of course, do all those things. But let them understand the importance of marriage. And when you encounter... Yes, go ahead. Um, so are you saying that you put your wife's health and priority before yours? Yes, 100%. 150%. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Here's here's how um, Scripture lays this out. Your relationship with Christ, especially. Well, let me do it from a pastor's perspective, I guess. Relationship with Christ. Okay. Tanya, my girls, and then the church. And early on, I had Christ, church, Tanya, and that that was headed for disaster. Um. So yes, absolutely. Put Prioritize your spouse over and above your children every single time. Because let me tell you something, them kids are going to be gone. It's going to be you, <clears throat> it's gonna be you and your wife. And they're going to be out of the house. And they're going to be gone. And if you've not nourished and poured into one another, you're going to look at each other and say, what do we do now? You know. So it's important to prioritize her or him, if you're, if you're a she, of course, uh, in marriage. Great question. But yes. Uh, so pray for your kids to marry and find godly mates. And you know, as a dad with two girls, <laughs> I, um, in fact, I tell people all the time, when I, was, when I was a young pastor in ministry, my mentor, my pastor, warned me against two things. He says, you got to set up guardrails and protect yourself in two ways. Financially, make sure there's guardrails set up that you don't get in trouble with, with money. Secondly, with women. Don't ever meet under any circumstance with a person of the opposite sex who is not your wife alone. Don't ever do that. I said, okay. 
So I was warned in those two ways. So now God, as I've set up these parameters of be careful, stay away from all other women beside your wife, not to be alone with, okay, and then uh, keep these boundaries away from money. And here I am, God's given me three women in my life who ensure that money stays away from me. (laughs) They ensure that on a daily basis. So God answered the prayer in a way I didn't think He would, but He did. Uh, so, yes, it's important to have these, these guardrails set up um, in, in, in marriage. So, great question about that. Um, in ministry, you're going you're gonna to talk to people. You're going to minister to people, serve with people, go on mission with people uh, who, are, who are single. And again, I, I want to make this clear. Um, Encourage them in that. Encourage them. Here's, here's, a, here's a good word of, of encouragement that I've heard before. Don't you dare allow your moment of singleness, you're in. Some of you are in a moment of singleness. You're still single. So don't dare allow this moment of singleness you're in to stop the mission of Jesus that you're on. I think that's a strong word. Let your relationship, number one, be with Christ. Uh, and then your spouse, then your family, then the church or ministry, whatever that is. Remember, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? What he was asking him was this, hey, Peter, do you love me? Or a good way to apply that today is uh, do you love Jesus asking all of us, do you love me more than you love ministry? So make sure you have those priorities set right. The Lord, your spouse, children, and then ministry. So uh, here's a few thoughts. Make much of marriage. And then I'll take some questions. So here's a few thoughts. Make much of marriage. Um, Make much of God's, it's not good for man to be alone. Make much of that, man. That's good news, guys, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Make much of the bridegroom to whom belongs the bride. Make much of the bride. When you make much of the bridegroom, you're making much of marriage. The, this, this eternal union that we have with Christ. Make much of the church being described as the bride of Christ. Uh, make much of till death do us part. Make much, not, it's not till divorce do us part. It's till death do us part. It's not as long as we both shall love. It's as long as we both shall live. That, that, our culture has it so messed up. Make room make, or make much of he who finds a wife finds a good thing. <laughs> Isn't that good? Make much of what God has joined together. Let not men separate. Make much of husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. Make much of in sickness and in health. i got to tell you something. When you're standing at that altar on your wedding day and you're looking googly-eyed into the eyes of your uh, fiancé, wife, or husband-to-be and you recite these vows, you are not thinking about in sickness. You're thinking about in health, not in sickness. I remember that day. We got a call from Tanya's doctor. We raced to his office. We went and sat in the waiting room. Okay? And a lot of other people in the waiting room. And we're in there. Uh, The receptionist sees sees us walk in. She goes and gets the doctor. I've never had this happen before. I hope I never have it happen again. The doctor walked out into the waiting room and grabbed us. The doctor and took us back in front of everybody else that had already been there. That's not good. <laughs> he took us to the other waiting You know the doctor's office has the main waiting room, then there's another waiting room. So he, he takes us in there, and he doesn't make us wait. He, he tells us, shuts the door, Tanya, it's cancer. And I don't, I don't think I heard anything else he said. You, you don't think about that in sickness 
when you're standing at that altar getting married. But I'm telling you, God did so much through Tanya's sickness. Um, the way she responded uh, physically was incredible. Her, she, she was young, healthy. I mean, she lives a very healthy lifestyle, so her body was in perfect shape to have the surgery that was required. So praise God that they got it at such an early time. We praise the Lord for that. But just through our marriage and emotionally and spiritually what God did, there were ups and downs through it. Um, she doesn't remember half the things she said to me. One day we were in the hospital, and we, we were in the hospital about six weeks at one point, at one time. She was recovering after a surgery and had multiple uh, blockages, and she had two or three more surgeries. And she's laying in the hospital bed, and, and she looks, and I'm standing at the foot of the bed, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure she has water and ice and those kind of things, and just been going on I mean, I'm, I'm caring for her just just hand and foot and she's very independent and she's very you know she's she's always been very active and she looked at me in, in, a, in a moment and said you know you don't have to treat me like a child and then in the same breath the same breath she was laying down and she had her feet uh, kicked out and the, and the blanket was just covering her ankles and in the same breath that she said you don't have to treat me like a child. Then she said this, are you going to cover up my feet or not? I mean, you know, those funny things like that that would happen in, in sickness and in health. We made much of marriage in sickness. We made much of marriage in health. Make much, make much of marriage in both regardless. Good times, bad times, make much of marriage. Let, make much of let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Make much of this text here. Make much of he who loves his wife loves himself. Make much of God making a helper suitable for Adam. Make much of Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool of the day. Uh, make much of husbands wash your wives in the word. Make much of wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Make much of blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb and use your marriage to do that. When you make much of your marriage, you're making much of marriage. So let's do it. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the opportunity to honor marriage in any situation, in public, in private, in sickness, in health, in rich, in poor, in good times, in bad times. God, let our focus be Hebrews 13, 4. Help us uh, point others to do the same and counsel them to do the same. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd help us in this endeavor. Uh, we pray for this time of just uh, question and answer, and God, you be honored through it. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Great. We got a microphone here if anybody has any questions in this first session. Then I think we'll take a break. Right, Doc? Correct? Okay. Any questions? Yes. Let me run that back to you. Y'all going to give me a workout today. I like that. Yes. All right. So the question I have, uh, he mentioned earlier parents who um, prioritize children above yeah. their marriage. Um, I've seen a lot, a lot of people who are like that. And what advice do you give when it comes to counseling parents who they schedule their entire day, weeks, months, everything entirely around their children? And it's very evident. How would you recommend counseling people like that? Um. I'd tell them to repent of their idolatry. No. <laughs> that their children are idols and they need to repent of that. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's our whole society. You know, when, when I was growing up, and this, I mean, I'm 47, so I'm not, I'm old, but this was in the 80s. When, when we would have Sunday dinners, um, the children didn't eat first. The parents ate first. The adults ate first. Then the kids ate. That's completely swapped today. So it's, it's, it's hard um, to counsel them in that, but what I would encourage them to is, is point them to Scripture. You know, it's very clear in, in the Bible. It's a husband-wife relationship. Husbands love your wives or wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives. Then children obey their parents, not parents obey your children. You know, I just try to counsel them in Scripture as much, 
much as I can because it's, a, it's something in America at least that every context and, and, and church is dealing with. It is true. You're right. That she would leave your dad over you. Yeah, mm. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of reality. Now, if there's if there's abuse happening and things like that, I mean, that takes it to a different level. We need to get the, we need to make sure the kids are safe. I mean, don't hear me on that. But obviously, for um, two believers, I mean, this this is the design of marriage and family. So certainly, yeah, great question. Any other? Oh, right here. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I know that you said, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I may have misheard you, yeah. but I believe you said that uh, biblical marriage is made for sex. Could you elaborate on that a little further? Um, I would say biblical marriage is necessary for, for sex. Like it, it can't happen outside of marriage. Um, sex is necessary for biblical marriage. Is that what you're talking about? Um, yeah, well, certainly biblical marriage is the place for this to occur. And in that marriage relationship, be fruitful and multiply. I mean, that, that's pretty clear uh, that God has designed um, this to occur. Therefore, man will leave his father and mother and uh, unite with his wife. The two becoming one flesh is another picture of that as well. So I would, I would lean toward that as well. That it's it's necessary for biblical marriage, uh, or it's 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 the design at least for where that's to happen for procreation to happen. Go ahead. Um, how do you handle a situation where that can no longer occur? Oh yeah, yeah. Well then, I mean, I would not, I would not push on that if it literally could not occur. Just as long as there's intimacy maybe not you know that eros love um in other ways that is shown physical affection just as long as those three loves are happening in marriage i think it's important for the agape phileo and the eros love to happen yeah great question oh okay thank you yes All right. Well, um, I guess we can take 10 minutes and then we'll come back for the last one. And on this last one, we're going to look at uh, 1 Peter. Um, it's a great text. And, and what, this te- what this next one's going to help you do, whether you're single or married or wherever you are, th- these are there's three for the ladies and three for the men, uh, just um, developing a character uh, for, uh, for being a godly man and being a godly woman that will ultimately lead to being a godly husband and godly wife. So this will be a good one in the next one. All right.